Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled, In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews. Does that suggest that Paul thought he was in the last days? This is lesson number five in that series for January 29 of 2022, entitled, Jesus, the Giver of Rest. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we delve into this very productive and challenging and very eventful book, uh, help us to understand what it all is going on and how it applies to us how it applied to the messages of the Old Testament, the experiences of people in the wilderness there, and now how that can apply to us in our day. May we understand these things clearly as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, so far in Hebrews, we have seen that Hebrews 1 and 2 talk about the relationship of Jesus to all his children, including angels, prophets, Moses, etc., Hebrews 3 and 4 talk about all those of the past, particularly the children of Israel, who failed to enter the rest that God had promised them. <clears throat> but in these chapters, Jesus is introduced as the one who will provide that rest. That rest was promised to Abraham and even David in 2 Samuel 7, 10 to 11, when God told him, Jim? The Lord instructed Nathan to tell David, I have chosen a place for my people Israel and have settled them there, where they will live without being oppressed any more. Ever since they entered this land and they have been attacked by violent people, but this will not happen again. I promise to keep you safe from all your enemies and do and to give you descendants. When you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will make one of your sons kings, king, excuse me, one of your sons king, and will keep his kingdom strong. He will be the one to build a temple for me, and I will make sure that his dynasty continues forever. American Bible Society, 1992, Good News Translation. Okay, make he one of his descendants king forever, huh? That sounds like a long, long time. Well, it doesn't really mean as long as it shall last. Yeah, I should go back and look at, uh, this is Hebrew, so I'm not that familiar with the Hebrew terms. Uh, forever in, in Greek would be as long as it's supposed to last, yeah. yeah. Because some people think that the festivals, yeah. should the Jewish festivals, I give you these for, if you go up forever. Yeah. <laughs> God recognizes that the ultimate rest is in a correct and perfect relationship with Him. That relationship can be practiced by carefully observing the seven-day Sabbath according to biblical guiding, guidance. However, unfortunately, as recorded in Hebrews 4, 1 through 11, Israel did not experience that rest. Gordon? From the Good News Bible, Hebrews 4. Now God has offered us the promise that we may receive that rest he spoke about. Let us take care then that none of you will be found to have failed to receive that promised rest. For we have heard the good news just as they did. They heard the message, but it did them no good because when they heard it, they did not accept it with faith. We who believe then do receive that rest which God promised. It is just as he said, I was angry and made a solemn promise they will never enter the land where I would have given them rest. He said this even though his work had been finished from the time he created the world. For somewhere in the scriptures, this is said about the seventh day, God rested on the seventh day from all his work. Do we know where that, that verse yeah, is? Yeah, and doesn't he, why didn't he give us the name of the book and the chapter and the verse? Well, of course, the answer to that is that there were no chapters and no verses, and those times, those there were, were books, yeah, and there, well, there were there were books, but they had different names than what we have today. So there were scrolls. Mm -hmm. There were scrolls. So that's from Exodus twenty and so, mm -hmm. uh, verse five. This same matter is spoken of again. They will never enter that land where I would have given them rest. 
Those who first heard the good news did not receive that rest because they did not believe. There are then others who are allowed to receive it. This is shown by the fact that God sets another day, which is called today. Many years later, he spoke of it through David in the scriptures, or in the scripture already quoted. If you hear God's voice today, do not be stubborn. If Joshua had given the people the rest that God had promised, God would not have spoken later about another day. Okay, I'm going to interrupt there for a second. Didn't they enter the land? Didn't Joshua conduct a couple of very successful campaigns to uh, drive out the inhabitants and leaving, uh, giving them a fair amount of territory they could settle down in? They entered the land, but they didn't, did not enter the rest. Okay. Is that the answer? Well, I want, I want to know if you was waiting to see if you're going to say something more. What, what kind of rest did they not get into? Did they not rest? Did not, did not experience? Well, they didn't experience any rest. They, they didn't experience the rest of the Sabbath. They didn't experience the rest of being faithful to God. They didn't experience the rest of yeah. just being in a comfortable situation. If you look at the end of the book of Joshua, you will see that things went fairly well until he and his co-workers uh, passed off the scene. And then you go into Judges 1, 2, and 3, and things just went go downhill just uh, very rapidly. So, no, they didn't experience. Once the leaders who were faithful to God were gone, things went crazy. They even told Joshua, we will obey you in everything just as we obeyed Moses. That's what they did, right? Just as they obeyed Moses. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They didn't obey Mo either of them. they kept it off with, if they step, anybody steps out of line, kill them. Yeah. yeah. You've got, I think it's, <laughs> you've got to put that all together. No as a prisons, package. no place to put them, they just get rid of them. So continuing uh, with verse 9, as it is, however, there still remains for God's people a, a rest, like God's resting on the seventh day. For those who receive that rest, which God promised, will rest from their own work, just as God rested from his. Let us then do our best to receive that rest so that no one of us will fail as they did because of their lack of faith. Okay, so the problem was what? <clears throat> it says because of their they, lack of faith. They didn't trust God. I mean, we've talked about in the past, but you know, they, they were given very clear instructions. If you just follow God, let him guide you, let him move before you, step by step, he will take care of everything. Oh no, we want to do it our way. Well, let us briefly review the history of our world up to that point. The people before the flood refused to believe in God or to trust him, and they died in the flood. The people immediately after the flood at the plain of Shinar did not trust God's statement that he would not send another flood, and they built that Tower of Babel, which God destroyed. Then God scattered them by confusing their language so they could not communicate. Despite all that God had done for them in getting them out of the slavery in Egypt, the Israelites did not trust God to take them into the land of Canaan according to his plan. And I'm just going to read at least a few of those verses. This is God speaking. Exodus 23, just actually just a few verses really, a couple chapters after the giving of the Ten Commandments from the Mount Sinai, I will send an angel ahead of you to protect you as you travel and to bring you to the place which I have, preserved, I have prepared. Pay attention to him, obey him, do not rebel against him, for I have sent him, and he will not pardon such rebellion. But if you obey him and do everything I command, I will fight against all your enemies. Didn't they believe that? My angel will go ahead of you and take you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will destroy them. Do not bow down to their gods or worship them, and do not adopt their religious practices. Destroy their gods and break down their sacred stone pillars. If you worship me, the Lord your God, I will bless you with food and water and take away all your illnesses. In your land, no woman will have a miscarriage or be without children. I will give you long lives. I will make the people who oppose you afraid of me. I will bring confusion among the people against whom you fight, and I will make all your enemies turn and run from you. Okay? 
How complicated is that? I will throw your enemies into a panic. I will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and Hittites as you advance. I will not drive them out within one year. If I did, the land would become deserted, and the wild animals would be too many for you. Instead, I will drive them out little by little until there are enough of you to take possession of the land. I will make the borders of your land extend from the Gulf of Aqaba to the Mediterranean Sea and from the desert to the Euphrates River. I will give you power over the inhabitants of the land and you will drive them out as you advance. Do not make any agreement with them or with their gods. Do not let those people live in your country. If you do, they will make you sin against me. If you worship their gods, it will be a fatal trap for you. And what happened? They got into that fatal trap. <laughs> they got into the fatal trap, absolutely. Well, instead, they asked for spies to be sent into the land to investigate before they entered. Then they rejected the advice of Caleb and Joshua and accepted the false report of the other ten spies. They decided they should go back to Egypt. When God told them not to do that and that he was sending them back into the wilderness for 40 years to die there, they rebelled again and tried to go, up and go in and conquer the land on their own without God's help. They suffered a terrible defeat. Even after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, being fed by manna, and having water provided every day, they were still not ready to let God take them into the land following his plan. So God finally allowed them to fight their way in, using their own swords and spears, killing everyone as they did so. And you can read about that in Deuteronomy 20, 10 through 18. And that's an exercise I really would encourage anyone who wants to understand what was going on out there in the wilderness and what happened in the land of Canaan, compare Exodus 23 with Deuteronomy 20. It's an eye-opener. How could God take them into his rest when they rebelled at every opportunity despite all that God had done for them? It was always God's plan that we remain in a perfect partnership with him, but of course that plan was broken when Adam and Eve believed the lies of Satan and ate the fruit, introducing sin to this world. In Genesis 15, 13 to 21, God had warned Abraham that his descendants would go through some very difficult times, but that eventually they would come back and claim the land in which he was wandering. We should probably read that because that's a very key part. You want to jump into that, Myra? You'll have to read. Can you read it off the screen? What you've got highlighted there? Mm-hmm. The Lord said to him, at the top. Uh, the Lord said to him, your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land. They will be slaves there and be treated, and will be treated cruelly for 400 years. But I will punish the nation that enslaves them. And when they leave that foreign land, they will take great wealth with them. You yourself will live to a ripe old age, die in peace, and be buried. There will be four generations before your de descendants come back here, because I will not drive out the Amorites until they become so wicked that they must be punished. Okay, that was the promise to Abraham. Um, the whole story of Abraham and his descendants down through slavery in Egypt is fairly well known. But all during that time, via messages handed down from their ancestors, they knew that their ultimate possession was supposed to be the land of Canaan. Wonder, did they, what did they think as they were slaves in Egypt of that promise? What they did not recognize or follow was the fact that the only way to enjoy rest and security in the land of God's blessings was to, one, follow his plan for their lives, two, learn to trust him, three, have faith in his plans for them. They must not adopt the horrible religious practices of the people living in Canaan. And guess what happened? Deuteronomy 12, one to four. Here are the laws that you would obey as long as you live in the land that the Lord your God, uh, Lord, that the Lord, your, the God of your ancestors is giving you. Listen to them. In the land that you are taking, destroy all the places where people worship their gods on high mountains, on hills, and under green trees. Tear down their altars and smash their sacred stone pillars to pieces. Burn their symbols of the goddess Asherah and chop down their idols 
so that they will never again be worshipped at those places. It's pretty clear what God wanted them to do, isn't it? Do not worship the Lord your God in the way that these people worship their gods. Out of the territory of all your tribes, the Lord will choose the one place, and where was that? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the one place where the people are to come into his presence and worship him. So they were not allowed to offer their sacrifices in Nazareth or Bethlehem or anywhere else. If you wanted to offer a sacrifice, you had to bring your sacrifice to Jerusalem and offer it there. Why do you suppose that was? So they wouldn't go up on the hilltops. <laughs> yeah. So notice here on the, uh, that uh, he says they'll d destroy their worship centers, but didn't say kill the people. No. No. Okay. No, the and people if, were supposed if, to be driven out. Well, but to drive them out because they have no place to do their worship. So they'll go place some distance away so they could have their worship or whatever they do. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I don't see any instruction there so far in the uh, k yeah. killing, uh, killing well, of them. Well, it was, it, yeah, the original instructions back in Exodus 23, there's nothing about killing. Yeah. Was in Egypt, what were they worshiping in Egypt? A ram. Uh, it, it, a that whole bunch of things. things, a whole bunch of things. Everything from scarab beetles no. to cats to they weren't the river to the everything. That Remember was a everything plague. that was in in the plagues. But did they have Asherah? Did they have that worship going on as uh, well? I'm not aware that they're worshiping Baal or Asherah. That was the fertility cult religions of mostly Semitic people, I think, uh, where they were going and uh, but they probably had their own version of yeah. fertility cult stuff down there I'm just not familiar with that so there you are to offer your sacrifices that are to be burnt and your other sacrifices your tithes and your offerings the gifts that you promised to the Lord your free will offerings and the firstborn of your sheep and your cattle and sheep there in the presence of the Lord your God who has blessed you you and your families will eat and enjoy the good things that you have worked for when that time comes, you must not do as you have been doing. So what does that mean? You must not do as you have been doing. What does that imply? That they weren't following the instructions. <laughs> they were doing all these things, crazy things already, weren't they? Until now you have, been, you have all been worshiping as you please, because you have not yet entered the land that the Lord your God has given you, where you can live in peace. When you cross the River Jordan, the Lord will let you occupy the land and live there. He will keep you safe from all your enemies and you will live in peace. The Lord will choose a single place where he is to be worshipped, that was Jerusalem as we know, and there you must bring to him everything that I have commanded, your sacrifices that are to be burnt and your other sacrifices, your tithes and your offerings, and those special gifts that you have promised to the Lord. Be joyful there in his presence, together with your children, your servants, and the Levites who live in your towns. Remember that the Levites will have no land of their own. You are not to offer your sacrifices wherever you choose. You must offer them only in the one place, Jerusalem, that the Lord will choose in the territory of one of your tribes. Only there are you to offer your sacrifices that, you are, to be, that are to be burnt and do all the other things that I have commanded you. So. Why do you think God just chose one spot? I mean, what if you lived in Galilee? A long way to travel to. I mean, back in the days when you walked, pretty much. Maybe all the way to trying to make it difficult for them to offer sacrifices because sacrifices isn't what he wanted. Of course. Mm -hmm. Is okay. that? Good answer. You know, where, where, is, where does he say that? In, is it Micah? Yeah, well. I don't want through. your sacrifices. I want your... Isaiah 1, Micah 6, Hosea 6, etc. Yeah. Well, they were still doing it in the days of Jesus. I mean, they were still traveling all the way from Galilee down to Jerusalem to offer their sacrifices. They hadn't learned a lesson. Mm -hmm. They thought, thought that God wanted things. He want, want, wanted gifts mm, to see. win his favor. What a pagan concept. Did they have any concept of what the the rest was? Well, I mean, Paul if, didn't, if he didn't lived think in, so. lived in captivity for however many years they were, I mean, none of the parents, this was all the descendants of them coming over. I mean, they had nothing. 
Was there a group within the Egyptian Israelites? The ones in G who lived in Egypt, yeah. Yeah, that were faithful. Well, I mean, sounds, that sounds would be their family. only example. Moses' it, family. Yeah, it sounds like Moses' family was faithful. And there probably were some others. Joshua's family may have been faithful, as far as we know. So maybe, they did have some examples. Maybe lots yeah. of them. We just don't know about them. It's pretty clear from their behavior as contrasted to Moses' behavior in the wilderness that uh, there was a pretty big, pretty big gap. Yeah. Well, there was. I just didn't know if they had any examples to, to show them what, how they were. Well, it seems pretty clear that the Moses was supposed to be the example. Yeah. Well, the fourth commandment handed down to the children of Israel on those tablets of stone at Mount Sinai and repeated by Moses 40 years later in Deuteronomy 5, 12 to 15, which is really not giving the full picture because obviously they were supposed to, and they did, worship God in one way or another for 40 years. So this isn't like they heard it now and then 40 years later again, they heard it again. No, they, this was something they practiced every week. How do we know that for sure? Because of the Sabbath, the manna that okay. didn't fall on Sabbath, among exactly. other things. Exactly. You had to go out twice, a, gather twice as much on Friday. It was not on Sabbath. I mean, that was a pretty good indication of what was supposed to be going on, right? Or was that a day to fast? Maybe some thought so. The Sabbath was to remind them, so what, what was the purpose of the Sabbath now? What, was, what were they supposed to get out of that rest? One, the Sabbath was to remind them of creation and that God was their ultimate Father. He also was and is the one who sustains our lives every minute. But it is so easy for us modern, as modern humans to get caught up in everything that is happening around us and everything we think is important right now that we desperately need the Sabbath to pause and think of what is really important. There's a term for that problem that I keeps popping up in my hand, my head. It's called the tyranny of the urgent. This needs to be done right. This needs to be done right, right now, right now, right now, right now. The tyranny of the urgent. Two, the Sabbath was also to remind them of all the incredible things that God had done to get them safely out of Egypt. But getting them out of Egypt was only the beginning. It had proved so much easier to get Israel out of Egypt, as hard as that was, than it was to get Egypt, in quotes, out of Israel. The challenge was, challenge was next to get them into the land of Canaan, following God's directions. But as Hebrews 3, 12 to 19 tell us, they failed to enter the land as God had promised. Shortly after leaving Mount Sinai, because they did not trust God, they did not believe, they did not have faith. So let's be very clear in case that anyone is confused about this. Trust, belief, faith. Those are all the same word in the ancient languages. Uh, persuasion. Persuasion, yeah, could be included there. Um, they chose rather to believe the false report of the ten spies rather than the reports given by Caleb and Joshua who were following God's directions. So what, I mean, I try to think about this in my own mind. What possibly could have possessed them to choose the report of the 10 spies. I mean, you would think, okay, they've been all pumped up, they're getting ready, they're on the border of the land of Canaan. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And, and then 10 guys come back and say, well, there's some scary people over there and I'm not sure we can conquer their cities. And what happened to the enthusiasm? Well, wasn't it correct that there were fortified cities? Wasn't it correct that yeah. there were giants? Wasn't it correct that there were lots of people there? They just didn't trust God to do what he said. Yeah, but the, the report of the spies, some, some of the people must have figured this out. The report of the spies was contradictory, just obviously contradictory, right within a few sentences. You know, this land is, there are giants over there, and here's this, this, this bunch of grapes that are so big we had to carry it to, on a pole between two men. But, the land is so terrible it doesn't even support, people don't even, can't even survive over there. Huh? It's 
So where did they find those grapes? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the pomegranates and the yeah. other things they brought back. Well, all the spies agreed originally that it was a beautiful land. They came back with one bunch of grapes so large that it had to be carried on a pole between two men. And as Gordon pointed out last week, what? That's now the symbol of the sure. tourism department of, 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 of uh, Israel. Israel. Modern Israel. They could look back a short time and remember all the incredible things that God had done for them. I mean, if you saw God do what he did in Egypt, you saw God do what he did on Mount Sinai, you saw God feed you and clothe you and, and, and give you water to drink and take care of you, no women having any miscarriages, all through the desert, would you think, let's see, I wonder if God can take care of us. Hmm. <laughs> it, just, it just blows my mind. Every day they experience the food, the water, the protection, the guidance that God gave them. Exodus 40, 36 to 38, the Israelites moved their camp to another place only when the cloud lifted from the tent. As long as the cloud stayed there, they did not move their camp. So what was this cloud? During all their meetings, they could see the cloud of the Lord's presence over the tent during the day and a fire burning above it during the night. I mean, how would it be to every day have the Lord give you exact directions, okay? Move, don't move. And how could they not know that he was there all the time? Yeah. But still, they refused to accept God's guidance or follow his instructions. Jim, can you tell us what Nehemiah had to say about that? Nehemiah, uh, chapter 9, verses 15 to 17. When they were hungry, you gave them bread from heaven and water from a rock when they were thirsty. You told them to take control of the land, which you had promised to give them. But your ancestors grew proud and stubborn and refused to obey your commands. They refused to obey. They forgot all of you. Did, excuse me. They forgot all you did. They forgot the miracles you had performed. In their pride, they chose a leader to take them back to slavery in Egypt. Mm. But you show. But you are a God who forgives. You are gracious and loving, slow to anger. Your mercy is great. You did not forsake them. Good news, Bible. Wow. Paul reminded us that what happened to them should not happen to us unless we lack faith. The entire adult population of Israel, except for Caleb and Joshua and Moses, had their bodies scattered across the wilderness. Why was it so difficult for them to trust God? So what can we do today to build our own faith and the faith of those fellow believers who worship with us? Look at this passage once again. Gordon? Hebrews 4, 4 through 8. For somewhere in the scripture, this is said about the seventh day. God rested on the seventh day from all his work. We talked about that already. This same matter is spoken of again. They will never enter that land where I would have given them rest. Those who first heard the good news did not receive that rest because they did not believe. There are then others who are allowed to receive it. This is shown by the fact that God sets another day, which is called, quote, today, close quote. Many years later, he spoke of it through David in the scripture already quoted. If you hear God's voice today, do not be stubborn. If Joshua had given the people the rest that God had promised, God would not have spoken later about that, about another day. Yeah. Good News Bible. If Joshua so, had given the people... Yes. If you have a King James, it will say of Jesus. So what's but, the difference? Isn't it? These, are these translators confused? No, they're not. The word Joshua in Hebrew is Jesus in Greek. So it yes. just depends on which language. So how do you know which one they're referring to? Joshua, Jesus, or Joshua? the? Well, look at the context. Um, the context is here. Who brought them into the land of Canaan? But it well, says... Well, God did. Okay, well, yes. But the, if, the if, human was Joshua. Yeah. Yes. If Joshua had given the people the rest that God had promised, 
Jesus what? was very willing to give them the rest. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's review that real quickly. What happened? When Joshua took the children of Israel, you know, of course, everybody knows the story of Jericho and Ai and their failures, and then they found out about Achan, and they went back and they conquered Ai. But if you get out, you need, in order to figure out what happened next, you really need to get out a detailed ancient map of Israel. And Joshua conducted one huge campaign to the south and another huge campaign to the north. And he was very successful. Everywhere they went, they were very successful. Then he went back and then he divided up the land. He said, okay, you, this is your piece. You, this is your piece. You, you, so forth and so forth. Here's the land. And then, okay, so you tribes go back. Each one of you is responsible for clearing out the people in your area. If you have problems, come ask the rest of us and we will help you as far as possible. That was instructions. They all went back, settled down with whatever little piece of ground they had and didn't bother to finish the job. So that's what happened. That's the story. It's more comfortable to be nice to these people. Well, it's, it's more comfortable not have to go out and fight them with your sword and your spear. But the, the sentence, if Joshua had given the people. Yeah. But he did give the people. They just didn't... Well, he, he didn't give them all the territory. He gave... He, he started the process. I And he did, did a good it's, job. It's... Okay. But they didn't finish up. It was so bad down in the area, area close to where the Philistines lived that was assigned to the tribe of Dan. And they never did, they, they just kept sort of sitting on the, on, the, on the edge of the territory that was given to Judah. And finally, a small group of the people from Dan says, we have to have some of our own territory. We can't just sit here because this is not our, our property. So they sent some people off, and you can read the story in the book of Judges, it's chapter 18. And they sent some people up. They traveled all the way up through the land, all the way up into the north, and they some things happened there, I won't go into the details, but they found a city separated somewhat from any other people. There's no other people around them, just peacefully living off by themselves. They said, well, we should be able to conquer that city. Well, and so the, the tribe of Dan moved from way in the south all the way to, nor to the north, the whole, the whole territory, because they thought it was too much trouble to try to fight with the Philistines, whoever was in the territory that had been assigned to them, that God would have given them if they had followed his, his faith. And thus we end up with the expression fairly often used in the Bible, from Dan to Beersheba. Beersheba is clear at the very at seven wells, Beersheba means seven wells, down in the desert. And Dan was way up in the north. Dan wasn't supposed, never, 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 supposed, never was supposed to be up there. But that's where they ended up. And then I, they disappeared after, yeah. after that. Yeah, I finally understand when, because I think of, you know, Joshua, had given the people yeah. that that it was given they didn't accept it but it was that the rest would come when they did what they were supposed to do yeah and they didn't do it yeah of course again what they were supposed to do was follow god and let god let drive the right. Right. drive the people it ahead of them it sounds like they were a bit scared to do anything just well it was too much trouble This promise which they failed to comply with was repeated as David reported in Psalm 95 and as Paul reported in Hebrews 4, 6, and 7. But even they did not fulfill all the requirements. So God continues to invite us today, in quotes, to enter his rest. Do you think that still applies to us? Mm -hmm. oh, Gordon, I think there's... Is oh, that is Myra? Today is a critical concept throughout Scripture. When Moses renewed Israel's covenant with God at the border of the Promised Land, he emphasized the importance of today. Deuteronomy 5.3, compare that with Deuteronomy 4.8, Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, etc. It was a moment of reflection to recognize God's faithfulness, Deuteronomy 11.2-7 and a time of decision to obey the Lord, Deuteronomy 5, 1 to 3. Similarly, Joshua called on the people of his time to choose for, for yourselves this day whom you will serve, Joshua 24, 15. 
King James. That's from the Bible, uh, adult Bi Sabbath school Bible study guide for Thank Tuesday, you, January 25. Sorry. And what are we told about our lack of faith? Is it similar to that, to how lack of faith affected Israel? Had Adventists, and this is very interesting. I just want to point out a couple of things here. You notice that that Adventist is capitalized. This was 19 years before there was a recognized, organized Seventh-day Adventist church. So Ellen White is here, even though she capitalizes this, she's talking about the Adventists as a group, a group of people who were followers of William Miller, and et cetera, et cetera. And she thought of them, you know, if they had done what they were supposed to do, if they had been faithful, if they had held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God. The Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. The work would have been completed and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. And when was that written? 1883. But in now, the- Isn't that almost 20 years after the Seventh-day Adventist Church was formed? Yes. So I, I thought you said it was before. The, but the original, group she was talking about was the Adventists at the time of the Great Disappointment. If they had yeah. followed along as they were supposed to. Okay. And so That's almost 20 years later, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was organized, and 20 years after, almost 20 years after that, She's writing. They're, they're, they failed to, yeah, she was writing, exactly. Okay. But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Thus the work was hindered and the world was left in darkness. Had the whole Adventist body, and once again she capitalizes that, united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history. It was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be thus delayed. God did not design that his people Israel should wander 40 years in the wilderness. He promised to lead them directly to the land of Canaan. They went right up there, right up to the very border, didn't they? He promised to lead them directly to the land of Canaan and establish them there, a holy, healthy, happy people. But those to whom it was first preached went, went not in because of unbelief. Their hearts were filled with murmuring, rebellion, and hatred, and he could not fulfill his covenant with, with them. And it's been suggested the problem was that they were following a different leader. Well, here's the really challenging part. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration, and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. Manuscript 4, 1883. Now, it is unbelief... Oh, was that written? 140 huh? years ago, almost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it, is, it, is un, it is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration, and strife. Where? Among the Lord's professed people. We're not talking about what's going on out there in the world. We're talking about the problems that are going on in the church. So we can see that God's invitation is still open to all those who will exercise faith. But it requires a time of decision. Will we join God's side permanently and irrevocably? Or will we continue to fall back and by default join Satan's side in the great controversy? With all these warnings before us, how could we make the mistake of repeating the mistakes of the past? Hebrews reminds us that it is those of us here on this planet who are the rebels to which God's plan is specifically focused. But the plan of salvation includes beings in the entire universe as well. Let's look at some evidence for that. Jim? Hebrews 2, 14 through 16. Since the children as he calls them, are people of flesh and blood, Jesus himself became like them and shared their human nature. 
He did this so that through his death he might destroy the work of the devil, who has the power over death, and in this way set free those who were slaves all their lives because of their fear of death. For it is clear that it is not the angels that he helps. Instead, he helps the descendants of Abraham. But Paul later wrote other words that were somewhat in con what might seem to be in contradiction to those words. Look at Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. I'll just start with that. For by the blood of Christ, we are set free. That is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God, which he gave to us in such large measure. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan. That's the mystery he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together. How much is included in all creation? The entire universe. Everything. Everything in heaven and on earth and with Christ as the head. So, Ellen White, and I don't, we won't take time to read those other verses, just more of the same. Ellen White uh, helps us Gives us some additional insights, Gordon. Through, through the plan of salvation, a larger purpose is to be wrought out even than the salvation of man and the redemption of the earth. Through the revelation of the character of God in Christ, the beneficence of the divine government would be manifested before the universe. The charge of Satan refuted, the nature and results of sin made plain, and the perpetuity of the law fully demonstrated. It's Ellen White, wow. Signs of the Times, 1893, and similar is repeated in several places. Yeah. Would you like me to continue? Go ahead. From, also from Ellen White. Uh, but the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. Now when it what? says broader and deeper, what does that mean? More. Yeah. How could it possibly be more than for us? Yeah, right. It was not for this alone, that is, not just for the salvation of man, that Christ came to this earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. John twelve thirty one and 32. And you know that... Um that looks like it's a quote from the King James Version. But the King James Version has the word men put in there in italics. That's Why? for emphasis, right? Yeah, wouldn't it, sometimes we use that for emphasis. But it turns out in the, in, the, in the King James Bible, if a word is in italics, that's because it's not there in the original language. And how do we know that Ellen White understood that very clearly? Reading As on. She continues, the act of Christ in dying for the salvation of men would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. That's okay. from Patriarchs and Prophets. Okay, what is it gonna do? Yep. Justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. Establish the perpetuity of the law of God, which of course is a reflection of his character. Reveal the nature and results of sin, which is also, in a sense, a reflection of his character, the law he had given. So these are all revelations of God, are they not? Mm -hmm. Well, we've already talked about leaving out the beings of the rest of the universe who are also key in the great controversy. Are we preparing or are we prepared for the second coming? How many Seventh-day Adventists are actively studying their Bibles, praying earnestly, and witnessing to their friends and neighbors? Can we explain the three angels' messages in a way that people can understand? Is that not supposed to be our final message to the world? Um, you want a good exercise sometime, invite some people over, some good 
Adventists over to your house for Sabbath lunch and then say, when the meal is over, could you explain to me the three angels' messages? See what happens. So what kind of rest is God offering to us? Well, in Hebrews 4, 1, 3, 5, and 10, Paul made it very clear that Israelites in the past did not accept God's invitation and did not trust him and thus failed to enter the rest. The Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and the repetition in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 5 invite us to remember what God has done for us and for our predecessors. It is God's intention that the Sabbath rest is to celebrate what God has done all the way from creation down through Mount Sinai, down through the life and death of Jesus Christ, all the way to our day. Jesus is now established on the throne in heaven and he's waiting for us to comply with the conditions so we can join him. And what are we still lacking? Reviewing once again, Hebrews 4, 8 to 11. Myra? If Joshua had given the people the rest that God had promised, here again that sentence that yes. I had issues with, God would not have, would ha God would not have spoken later about another day. As it is, however, there still remains for God's people a rest like God's resting on the seventh day. For those who receive that rest which God promised will rest from their own work just as God rested from his. Let us then do our best to receive that rest so that no one of, one of us will fail as they did because of their lack of faith. Okay, so that's the problem. And what is faith? Just to review very quickly. Faith is a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a personal friend. And the better we know him, the better that relationship will be. Can be, anyway. In these verses, God is inviting us not only to remember what happened in the past, but also to look forward to God's plans for us in the future. Have you found Sabbath observance to be a foretaste of heaven? Well, what about these verses from Isaiah 66, 22 and 23? Just as the new earth and the new heavens will endure by my power, so your descendants and your name will endure. On every new moon festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem. And that, of course, is not the old Jerusalem, but the new Jerusalem, right? I have a friend who's passed now, but he used to say, we're going to come together in heaven on the Sabbath, and we're going to talk to God, and we're going to tell him about all the exciting things we discovered and learned in the previous week, and God is going to smile and say, yeah, next week, why don't you try this and this and this? And you'll discover a whole bunch more things that you didn't know about yet. That sounds exciting to me. Jewish tradition upholds this idea about the Sabbath. And here's some brief things from ancient Jewish doctrines, documents that will uh, um, give us some little idea about how they felt about it. Um, Life of Adam and Eve and James Ch Charles Worth, the Old Testament Pseudepigrapha, a work composed between 100 BC and AD 200 said, the seventh day is a sign of the resurrection, the rest of the coming age. Another ancient Jewish source said, quote, the coming age is the day which is holy Sabbath rest for eternity. That's from Jacob Neusner, the Mishnah, a new translation. The Othiot of Rabbi Akiba, the la a later source said, Israel said before the Holy One, blessed be he, master of the world. If we observe the commandments, what reward will we have? He said to them, the world to come. They said to him, show us its likeness. He showed them the Sabbath. Theodore Friedman, The Sabbath, Anticipation of Redemption, Judaism, Accordingly Journal, and so forth. Have we learned how to make the Sabbath a foretaste of heaven? In light of the fact that so many um, of our Christian friends have rejected the Sabbath and worship on, worship on Sunday, notice these very interesting comments. Jim? It is therefore, excuse me, it is very significant that Paul in Hebrews use the Sabbath rest and not Sunday as a symbol of the salvation through grace that God offers us. 
The use of Sabbath rest in this way implies that Sabbath was cherished and observed by believers. From the second century AD forward, however, we find evidence of a decisive change in the church. Sabbath observance ceased to be considered a symbol of salvation and was instead considered a symbol of allegiance to Judaism and the Old Covenant, one that had to be avoided. For example, Ignatius of Antioch, around AD 110, remarked, those who lived according to the old order have found the new hope. They no longer observe the Sabbath, but the first day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, excuse me. The day our life was resurrected with Christ. Yox Dukin, Israel and the Church, two voices for the same God. Okay, let's, let's just hesitate for just a second. What, where, how early was the very first evidence that Sunday was called the Lord's Day? Do you know? About 270 A.D. Never at any time before that was Sunday referred to as the Lord's Day. Okay, go ahead. Marcion ordered his followers to fast on Sabbath as a sign of rejection of the Jews and their God. And Victorinus did not want to appear that he observed to appear that he he observed the Sabbath of the Jews. See Israel and the Church, pages forty one to forty five. It was the loss of the understanding of Sabbath observance as a symbol of salvation by grace that led us excuse me, that led to this demise of the Christian Church, Adult Sabbath School. Bible study guide for Friday, January 28th. Okay, so now let's halt and talk about that for a second. Um, clearly it was the case that as the Christian church moved further and further away from Jewish traditions, and, and we know about Paul saying, you know, we can't follow all those old traditions and so forth. Well, pretty soon Sabbath just became a part of being a Jew. Sabbath is Jew, Sabbath Jew. So if you kept the Sabbath, you were considered to be a Judaizer. And so that was a good excuse. I'm sure a very clever point of, from, on, from Satan's uh, perspective to get people to reject the Sabbath. Ellen White responded with these words. From the Desire of Ages, the Sabbath is a sign of Christ's power to make us holy. And it is given to all whom Christ makes holy. As a sign of his sanctifying power, the Sabbath is given to all who through Christ become a part of the Israel of God. The Sabbath points them to the works of creation as an evidence of his mighty power in redemption. While it calls to mind the, rest the lost peace of Eden, it tells of peace restored through the Savior. And every object in nature repeats his invitation. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight, Quoted from Desire of Ages, 288 to 289. Do we clearly understand the differences between observing the Sabbath as a day God intends as a foretaste of heaven and doing it in a legalistic manner just to fulfill the requirements? Myra? The Sabbath of observant, observance remains. Let us begin first by defining the rest of Hebrews 4, verse 9. According to the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary, the word rendered as rest in Hebrew 4, 9 comes from the Greek... Sabbatismas. Okay. Meaning a resting from previous activity which in later use become, comes to mean a Sabbath-keeping, a form of the word Sabbatizo. To rest, to cease, to keep the Sabbath. Sabbatizo. Is used seven times in the Septuagint. Septuagint, the Jews' Greek translation of the Old Testament. Once the literal Seventh-day <laughs> Seventh Sabbath um, once of other Sabbaths, 
on that. This I'm is, sorry. This is a, the use of this word is once of the literal Seventh-day Sabbath. It was yes. applied once to the literal Seventh-day Sabbath, once to other Sabbaths, and five times of the land's resting and the sabbatical year. Yeah, with many texts to go along mm -hmm. with. According to the fundamental idea expressed by Sabatisto. Sabatizzo. Oh, okay. In the Septuagint. In the Septuagint is that of resting or ceasing from labor or other activity. Hence, the usage of the related Greek and Hebrew words implies that the noun sabbatismos yes. may denote either the literal Sabbath rest or simply rest or cessation in more than in a more general sense. Thus, the linguistic study of the word sabbatismos in Hebrews 4.9 leaves it uncertain whether the weekly Sabbath rest is here referred to or simply rest or cessa cessation in, general, in a general sense. Context alone can decide the matter. Okay, so what does Paul go on to tell us that helps us to des describe that? We're going to need to... Need a little more. Why, why don't I jump in there? The writer of Hebrews appears to use katapausis, ceasing from labor, see in Hebrews 3.11, and sabbatismos more or less synonymously, so a ceasing. Because, and katapausis, does that sound a little bit like our English word pause? Yes. Yeah, that's where it came from. Because, because Joshua could not lead Israel into the spiritual rest, katapausis, uh, sabbatismos remains for Christians. Consist consistency seems to require that w what remains be seen as what was there to begin with. So this is a continuation. And then I'm going to jump down here. It's clear that what remains for the people of God is the New Testament is this katapausis or sabbatismos. The fact that in the Septuagint, the Bible of the New Testament, katapao and sabbatizo, are used interchangeably to note the Seventh-day Sabbath would tend to preclude the suggestion that the writer of Hebrews intended to make a distinction between the noun forms of these words. And this is really complicated stuff. But anyway, it, basically it's saying is that God intended us for, for us to understand the rest of the Sabbath to be a true rest and, and preparation for fi the final events. Ellen White supports that idea. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to study your word, to think about these things, even though sometimes uh, they might seem to be a little complicated. We thank you for the rest that we can enjoy, that it was intended to be a foretaste of heaven, and it is for some of us. May we use that opportunity, the foretaste of heaven, to share the good news about heaven to others is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.